We'll, we'll have uh, Dr. Tung, and the title of his presentation is Isochronal Late Activation Mapping. Great. Uh, Vivek, Srini, Andre, Frank, David, congratulations again. And it really is a privilege to be able to have the opportunity to speak in front of this audience of, of giants, and we're all teachers and students at the same time. I'm talking about isochronal late activation mapping of ventricular tachycardia. I don't think it's too controversial that when there's a single VT, um, the, the critical isthmus is really probably the holy grail, and the identification of that in sinus rhythm is ideal. This is a epicardial reentrant circuit that's validated both on rhythmia and navix uh, in an inferior infarction. And I think if that we were able to be able to localize this critical isthmus site during sinus rhythm, uh, that would be advantageous clinically. So can they be identified during functional mapping of sinus? So everyone does know that the majority of ventricular tachycardia is hemodynamically untolerated. And the vast majority of centers work off of a structural scar-based map. And we've heard about the limitations of voltage. And an understanding of the sinus rhythm scar propagation pattern, which is a functional map in its relationship to isthmus sites, is mechanistically and clinically valuable. So the current strategies now is to map scar burn scar, tag isolated late potentials, and then with a combination of pace mapping, we all have some sense that fractionated or uncoupled potentials are important, and then homogenization can be done either with core isolation as a focus homogenization or dechanneling. It's important to understand that we often use slow conduction as kind of this ubiquitous term for anything that looks to also be late, but it is different in terms of when you describe a delayed activation versus a late activation. So slowing is actually something that requires you to see from point A to point B rather than being able to make a determination of velocity with just one point. So late does not equal slow. And here's an example where in this multi-electrode catheter, the greatest slowing is between point one, two, and three there. And then as you get into an area that's activated late, its conduction velocity is actually not as slow. So late, again, does not equal slow. We, also, we understand the limitations of SCAR. And here is, I think Pasquale already showed something like this. This is an ex vivo pig porcine MRI SCAR where we actually did the histogram of normal left ventricular voltage as well as transmural. And it's important just to understand that there is a overlap and SCAR is not binary. So I think Pasquale was mentioning that up to three or four uh, millivolts is really consistent with normal voltage, but here you can see there's a tremendous overlap. So when you're in a region of 1.5 or 2, you could be sitting on transmural scar or normal. We also understand that this has been shown multiple times that there's directional dependence in terms of the orientation, and here you can see a very drastic difference in not only the appearance, but the voltage of this uh, site on the distal ablation when you do RV to LV pacing. So. In terms of being able to de-channel or eliminate a channel, we did, we did try to answer the question that if we ablate an earlier late potential, can we eliminate all downstream activation? And when the LA Marathon runs through any sort of, runs through Los Angeles, it's pretty well understood that you don't need to block off every single road, but if you actually block off some of the critical entrance points, you can create an activity within that region to be able to allow a marathon to occur. So it doesn't necessarily need to be carpet bombed for the whole thing if you can selectively find the entrance sites into SCAR. And this is just an example that is very much akin to PVI, that sometimes you hit one spot and all of the other downstream potentials go away. And this is over a 26 millimeter uh, distance when you ablate a feeder late potential. In this cohort, it was actually our best series in terms of freedom from VT at UCLA, where 86% with a mixture of ischemic and non-ischemic did not have recurrence of VT at a year. Um, the same is true with the channeling in Spain, where Bruzo and et al. with colleagues demonstrated a 91% freedom. I think that might be the best in the whole field for ARVC. That is a really unbelievable freedom from VT with a de-channeling technique. So it's clear that if you ablate a feeder, that downstream activity can go away. But what's not clear is which channel, whether you look at ripple mapping, when you look at these channels, which one is functionally most important? So this is really isochronal late activation mapping, or what we call ILAM, is a method to be able to prioritize late potentials and using the sequence of activation during sinus rhythm. 
And the question is, is really how does slow conduction and late activation relate to critical sites during VT? And how, what do the propagations patterns within SCAR look like? And I'm happy to see that we saw three movies today from three different presenters about SCAR propagation in terms of in sinus rhythm. And this is, again, a functional analysis of physiologic conduction. This is the paper that I'm describing, which was really the relationship of late activation zones done by a rising star, Tata Novo Iri, during his time with us at UCLA. And the methods are that we just simply divide the sinus rhythm LAT into eight isochrones. And the reason you do that is because isochrones can give you a sense of conduction velocity visually. The critical sites, we chose the perfect cases where we had a critical site by entrainment or rapid termination of VT, and we asked the question, where do they fall on an isochronal map? Now, the important methodology here is this is time consuming, and as Hiroshi manually annotates things, these are all manually annotated to the offset of the late potential. And that's just to be clear, because when you look at the onset or the maximum DVDT, and you look at a highly fractionated complex electrogram, there's going to be less reproducibility between observers to be able to decide which one to tag in terms of the onset or the peak. So what we did was we uniformly tagged everything to the offset. And annotation will be able to do this when you do a right to left sweep rather than a left to right sweep. Here's how it works. This is a 26-year-old uh, girl from Notre Dame who syncopized and had a new diagnosis of ARVC. Traditional scar map, lots of low voltage on the inferior surface of the epicardial right ventricle. This is, the left ventri this is a left bundle branch block superior axis VT that we were hunting. Lots of voltage abnormalities. But let's take a look to see how the scar propagates during sinus rhythm. And what you see is there is a region that is activated late, but there's a region here that is activated with slow conduction, which is a zone of deceleration. When you look at that deceleration zone on an isochronal map, it helps you visually understand that obviously right when the isochronons start crowding, there is a region of deceleration. And that crowding area, how does that relate to ventricular tachycardia? Well, this crowding area has four isochrones that are bunched up within about a two centimeter area. So when you divide isochrones with eight isochrones, you're talking about almost 50% of the whole window that's being mapped in a very localized area during sinus rhythm. This is the correlation with ventricular tachycardia. And this is what appears to be a figure of eight epicardial reentrant circuit. And as you can see, the critical isthmus site appears to be coursing through the zone of deceleration during sinus rhythm. The late activation site is actually appears to be an outer loop as well. So the, again, showing that the latest late potential may not be most functionally relevant, but the regions of deceleration may be potentially more important. And then when you combine this with an endocardial and epicardial map, the same VT, what you can see is it is truly an epicardial isthmus where it goes blank during the isthmus activation on the endocardium. You only see the breakout endo. It comes back around as a figure of eight, but you lose the diastolic corridor. So this really confirms that it's an epicardial VT. The results are with 47 VTs that we analyzed in 33 patients. The critical site was 18 millimeters away from the latest site. So we all get excited when we see a late potential, and a very late potential is even more exciting, but potentially they may not be the most functionally relevant. But what was relevant here is that the, there was a median of three isochrones with it, around the critical site within a one centimeter radius, which shows that you have about a third of the sinus rhythm window within a small region. When you look at the isochrones here, only 10% of them we're in the latest zone of activation. So again, late does not equal slow. So here's just an illustration of where the latest site actually may be a bystander. This is two to one activation in the latest zone of activation on an isochronal map. So really, the, the movement here would be to abandon, or not fully abandon, but to complement a, a SCAR map with a functional map and say, let's do an isochronal map and look to see where there are regions of deceleration, and then to go after these as the priority in a homogenized strategy. So this is not mutually exclusive with any of the strategies that have been mentioned. It's more of a further refinement of which channel to target. And lastly, this is evidence of a shared isthmus and ischemic cardiomyopathy at a deceleration zone. There's the sinus rhythm, and you can see where the impulse conduction gets a little slowed up right there. 
and we have two x we have two VTs, inferior and superior axis, and you can actually see that this is evidence of a shared isthmus in the region of deceleration in a patient an endocardial ischemic interoceptal infarct. And uh, thank you very much for your time.